Welcome back, class. This is the final section of new material that we're going to cover in the course. And in this section, we're going to talk about the first derivative test. And I should say at the front that the first derivative test actually exists to answer a bunch of different questions. So the first type of question that the first derivative test can answer is to classify critical points. And when I say classify critical points, I want to remind you that we talked about there really being three flavors of critical points, namely a critical point could look like this, in which case we call it a local min, could look like this, in which case we call it a local max, or it could look like one of these two things, in which case we call it a kink. So what we'd like to be able to do with the first derivative test is take just an equation for a function, find the critical points, and decide which of these it is. So we'd like to be able to start with an equation, and we'd like to be able to, from that equation, say, okay, the critical numbers are 3, 9, and negative 5, 3 and 9 are local mins, and negative 5 is a kink. That's what we'd like to be able to do. That's our first goal. Our second goal consists of talking about increasing and decreasing. Namely, we'd like to be able to identify where a function's increasing and where a function is decreasing. So remember, our graphs of functions may well look like this. And if I have a graph of a function that looks like this, I would say that this function is increasing on negative infinity to 1 and 5 to infinity. That's where it's increasing. And it would be decreasing on 1 to 5. All I'm saying here is at all the inputs up to 1, the function's increasing. It's leaning that direction. Between 1 and 5, it's decreasing. Again, these are all in terms of inputs, so this 1, 5 is not a coordinate point. It's an interval referring to the inputs between 1 and 5. And then the function's increasing again. Namely, it's increasing at all the inputs bigger than 5. So that's our second goal. And what I want to point out is that these two goals are, in fact, very closely related to each other. Because... If you look at this graph where I've talked about where the function is increasing and where it's decreasing, you'll notice that the boundaries, that is this 1 and 5, where it swaps from increasing to decreasing and decreasing to increasing, these things correspond exactly to the critical numbers. And this comes back to something we've observed before, which is that a function can only change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing at a critical number. So effectively, it's going to turn out that exactly the same procedure is going to let us answer both this question about classifying the critical points into these three categories, and what intervals the function's increasing and decreasing on. All of this is ultimately going to come down to constructing what I'm going to call a derivative profile. And what is a derivative profile? A derivative profile is a number line on which we mark all of the critical numbers for a function. So for example, if I write down a derivative profile of this function, I'm going to mark off 1 and 5. I'm going to label it if this, is, if this function is f of x. I'm going to label my derivative profile f prime of x. And then I'm going to mark for each of these pieces, and by these pieces I mean this chunk up to 1, this chunk from 1 to 5, and this chunk from 5 over to infinity, whether the derivative there is positive or negative. And so over in this piece, that is up to 1, the derivative is positive. From 1 over to 5, the derivative is negative. And then from 5 out to infinity, the derivative is positive. Again, I'm marking here the derivative, not the value of the function. So the derivative is positive because here the tangent lines have positive slope. Here the tangent lines have negative slope, so the derivative is negative. And here again, the tangent lines have positive slope, so the derivative is positive. From this, 
we'll be able to identify the answers to both of these questions. And I want to explain how to do that. Namely, let's forget that we had the graph in front of us, and let's just look at this derivative profile. The information that's contained here is that we have a function which has critical numbers at 1 and 5, both marked with a vertical slash. And here it's important to recall this connection we've made before between positive derivative and increasing and negative derivative and decreasing. So that means once I have this derivative profile, I can immediately translate that the function's increasing on this piece, decreasing on this piece, and increasing on this piece. Now I'm going to use symbols for increasing and decreasing, namely for increasing, I'm going to write an arrow that goes this direction, that is pointing right and up. And for decreasing, I'm going to use an arrow that points right and down. This should not be too hard of a code to crack, because increasing functions are ones whose graph goes this way, and decreasing ones are functions whose graph goes this way. So, what am I going to do now? I'm going to make another number line that has information not about f prime, but a number line that has information about f. I'm going to mark off the same points on this number line that has information about f, and I'm going to translate the information about f prime to the information about f using this identification. So because f prime is positive on this interval, f is increasing on this interval. Because f prime is negative on this interval, f is decreasing on this interval. And because f prime is positive on this interval, f is increasing on this interval. So once I've told you how to make one of these derivative profiles for a function, the question of where the function's increasing and where it's decreasing immediately follows just by replacing the pluses with increasings and minuses with decreasings, and that will tell me the intervals of increasing and the intervals of decreasing. So in this particular example, from the derivative profile, we would get that this function's increasing on minus infinity to 1 and 5 infinity. And you're free to put whatever symbol between these you want. You could put the word and, you could put a union symbol, you could put no symbol, you could put a comma, whatever you want. It's increasing on these two intervals, and it is decreasing on 1 to 5. So if you'll recall, I gave us two goals. One was to decide where the function was increasing and decreasing. And so again, once I've told you how to make a derivative profile for a function, we know how to do that. That's what I've just shown you here. The other goal is to figure out whether the critical numbers are local mins, local maxes, or kinks. But what's beautiful about the way I've drawn this is it's quite suggestive of what has to be happening at this point, namely this critical point 1 here. Here the function switches from increasing to decreasing. And if you just imagine what it has to look like to switch from increasing to decreasing, it has to look like that. It has to look like an upside down U. And so the fact that at 1 it switches from increasing to decreasing tells me that this critical number corresponds to a local max. Likewise, at this point 5, the function switches from decreasing to increasing, and switching from decreasing to increasing, if you think about it, forces the graph to look like this sort of right side up U. So that is to say this corresponds to a local min. Let me summarize that for you. A critical point where a function switches from increasing to decreasing is a local max. Okay. Again, that's that picture, increasing to decreasing, and so you can just draw this upside down U. Likewise, a critical point where a function switches from decreasing to increasing is a local min. And again, you can think about this picture, decreasing to increasing, that's going to give you this U shape. And then lastly, remember there were actually three kinds of critical points. 
There were local mins, local maxes, and kinks. And the kinks are actually the critical points where the function does not change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So in this case, the picture on the left, this is decreasing, decreasing. And the one on the right, this is increasing, increasing. So a critical point where neither of these first two things happens, those are kinks. So those are where the graph looks like that or like that. So then ultimately, what is the first derivative test going to tell us? The first derivative test is going to tell us how to make a derivative profile. And once we have the derivative profile, then we'll be able to answer both of these questions. Where is the function increasing and where is it decreasing? And are these critical points local mins, local maxes, or kinks? So let me do an example first. So for this function, I want to do the following thing. I want to find the critical points, I want to classify them, and I want to identify what intervals this function is increasing on and what intervals this function is decreasing on. So I want to do all of those things. So the first step to doing all of that is that I'm going to find the critical numbers and put them on a number line. So in this case, when I go to find the critical numbers, I take the derivative here f prime of x is 3x squared minus 3. I set that equal to 0. And I get x equals plus or minus 1. So I'm going to make my number line here. I'm going to put in minus 1 and plus 1. And this is going to turn into my derivative profile. Now I want you to notice this first step here of finding the critical numbers is exactly the same first step as the first step of the closed interval method. Okay. The only new thing so far is that we've put them on the number line. But at this next step, things are going to get weirder. So next step, I'm going to choose a point in each piece of the number line and evaluate the derivative there. Okay, so we're going to have test points and we're going to evaluate the derivative. So I'm just picking any point at all between minus one and one. There are lots of points between minus one and one, but I'm going to pick zero. Likewise, there are lots of points over here in this piece bigger than one, but I'm going to choose two. And over here, I'll choose minus three. Now, you might ask, why zero? Why two? Why minus three? And it does not matter at all. I can choose literally any point I want in each interval. And by each interval, I mean the pieces that the number line has been broken up into by the critical numbers. So in this case, there are two critical numbers, so the number line got broken up into three pieces. So I have chosen minus three, zero, and two as my test points, so I need to evaluate the derivative at each of these points. So f prime of minus three, that's 24. f prime of zero, that's minus three. And f prime of two, that's nine. I want to make a whole bunch of notes here to make sure that we always do this correctly. So first note, every part of this second step is different from the closed interval method. In the closed interval method, instead of these test points, we actually plugged in the critical numbers themselves. And instead of plugging them into the derivative, we plugged them into the original function. So make super sure when you're following either the first derivative test or the closed interval method that you very carefully make sure you know what you're doing and that you're plugging the right things in the right places. Okay, so that's thing one. Warning, be super careful. The first derivative test and the closed interval method look super similar. They start out exactly the same, but they're very different. Second, 
I want to note that we've sort of cluttered up the number line by adding these test points to it. We originally have the critical numbers marked off, and then we've added three more things to it. But ultimately, we need to keep track of which is which. So my advice, and this is what I always do, is to mark your critical numbers with a horizontal slash like this. Okay, as I have done here at minus one and plus one. And mark your test points with a dot. That will assure that you don't confuse your test points that you've chosen with your critical numbers. Okay, step three is going to be to finish the derivative profile. Now, it might seem like, oh, how are we going to do that? He hasn't told us. But remember, what the derivative profile is supposed to tell us is whether on this piece, the derivative is positive or negative. But I know the value of the derivative here is 24. And in particular, 24 is positive. So in fact, all I need to record from this 24 is that it is positive. The other information is not relevant. So the fact that this is a positive 24 as opposed to a positive six is not relevant. All I need to do is record the positive. Likewise, my derivative profile is supposed to tell me whether the derivative is positive or negative between minus one and plus one. Okay. But I know that at zero, it's minus three. So therefore, it must be that the derivative is negative here in this piece. And then finally here in this last interval, I know that at two, the derivative is nine. Nine is positive, so the derivative must be positive here in this interval. Finally, step four is going to be to make an increasing decreasing profile for your original function. So how do I do that? I take exactly the same number line, but instead of labeling it f prime of x, I label it f of x, mark off the same points. But then I remember positive derivative means increasing, negative derivative means decreasing, and positive derivative again means increasing. And so now I have all of the information presented right here to answer all of the questions that I want. So first of all, I can answer the intervals of increasing decreasing. Again, all I did here was translate this diagram to the three intervals. So it's increasing on these two intervals, it's decreasing on this interval. So that was the first question. The other question was about classifying the two critical points, which were minus 1, 6 and 1, 2. Okay. The x-coordinates, by the way, here, this minus 1 is just that minus 1, this 1 is that 1, and the y-coordinates you get by plugging minus 1 and 1 into the original function that we're talking about. So this minus 1, 6, what is this? Is this a local min, a local max, or a kink? Well, I look over here at the graph, and I see that at minus 1, my function switches from increasing to decreasing. Which, and I can even almost just see this popping out of the way that I've drawn this picture, this is a local max. Likewise, if I look at 1, 2, that corresponds to here, here we see the function switches from decreasing to increasing. And again, I can almost see the swoop here, this is a local min. This is what the first derivative test lets us do. It lets us produce this profile that tells us on what intervals the function is increasing and decreasing. And from there, we can answer both that question and the corresponding question of whether the critical points are local mins, local maxes, or kinks. Let's run through that for another example. Here's another function. Again, you get to answer lots of questions with the first derivative test, the questions on the homework and the tests, might ask you to answer all of them or just some of them. But for now, we'll go ahead and answer everything. So we'll say what intervals this function's increasing and decreasing on. We'll write down the critical points and we'll identify whether those critical points are local mins, local maxes, or kinks. So first step, 
we need to take the derivative. And then we need to solve this derivative being equal to zero. And so from that, I get my three critical numbers. X is zero, X is plus three, and X is minus three. And I need to put all of these things onto a number line. And remember, I'm going to label this number line G prime. Now, I should emphasize, the number line is only useful if I put these in order. So I cannot put them in the order 0 plus 3 minus 3. I have to actually put them in the order that they go in in the number line. So minus 3, 0, plus 3. So that's what I called step 1 before. I found the critical numbers by setting the derivative equal to 0. I laid them out on the number line, labeled the number line g prime. What's the next thing I have to do? The next thing I have to do is choose a test point in each of the intervals that the critical numbers have broken my number line into. Namely, I have a break here, a break here, a break here. So there are four different pieces, and I have to go ahead and choose a test point in each of these. I will not be too creative. I will choose 4 and 1 and minus 1 and minus 4. And I will go ahead and evaluate g prime at each of these four orange test points. Now remember, I definitely don't want to evaluate g prime at the critical numbers. Because if I evaluate g prime at the critical numbers, at least if I do it correctly, I had better get zero, because that was how I found the critical numbers. Nor do I want to be plugging anything into the original function. In the first derivative test, we need to be plugging these orange test points into the derivative. So g prime of minus 1, we can check that's 32. g prime of 1, we can check that's minus 32. And you might, at the point when you go to find g prime of 4, think, oh, well, those numbers are pretty large. But if you want, feel free to pull out your calculator or Wolfram Alpha or whatever, and you can see that g prime of 4 here is 112, and g prime of minus 4 is minus 112. Now, we go ahead and record the actual only piece of information we wanted about each of these four numbers. That is, whether they are positive or negative. Negative 112, that's negative. Positive 32, that's positive. Negative 32, that's negative. Positive 112, that's positive. And after doing that, we've completed our derivative profile. Brief aside, what if I did not have a calculator? How would I fill in these numbers? Well, I would notice that g prime of x is, and I factored this already, 4x times x squared minus 9. And then I would ask myself, okay, if I plugged minus 4 in here, I would get 4 times minus 4 times 16 minus 9. And probably there's no way to see immediately off the top of your head that, hey, that's minus 112. But remember, that's not actually what I need to know. I only need to know that g prime of minus 4 is negative. And that is actually quite plain here, because this 4 is positive, this 16 minus 9 is positive, and this minus 4 is negative. So positive times negative times positive, that's going to be negative. So actually, when I'm filling out my derivative profile, I don't even necessarily need to know exactly what the derivative is, is at each of these points. I only really need to know whether the derivative is positive or negative at each of these points. And often, just by factoring the derivative, I can figure that out, even if the numbers involved end up being quite large. Anyway, that was an aside. Let's go back to finishing up the problem. And so, having completed this derivative profile, we can now go back and complete a profile of where g of x is increasing and where it's decreasing. So if I do that, I copy my critical numbers down here and I translate. Okay, here, the derivative was negative, so g itself is decreasing. Here, the derivative is positive, 
so g itself is increasing. Negative, decreasing, positive, increasing. And so that tells me where g of x is increasing and where it's decreasing. From there, I can write down the answer to our two questions. Okay. First question, where is g increasing and where is it decreasing? Well, it's increasing on minus 3 to 0 and 3 to infinity. And it is decreasing on negative infinity to minus 3 and 0 to 3. Second question, for each of my three critical points, which were minus 3 something, 0 something, and 3 something, were they local mins, local maxes, or kinks? This one that was minus 3 something, I can look at my number line and see here the function switches from decreasing to increasing, which means that this is a local min. Here at 0, it switches from increasing to decreasing, so this is a local max. And here at 3, it switches from decreasing to increasing, so this is a local min. The only thing left to do is to fill in the y coordinates here. But remember, I fill in the y coordinates here just by plugging the x coordinates into the original function. And so if I plug in minus 3, I get 81 minus 72 plus 2, which is 11. If I plug in 0, I just get 2. And if I plug in 3, I actually again get 81 minus 72 plus 2, which is 11. And so this is the answer to every possible question that you could ask with the first derivative test about this function. All right, I'll wrap up this intro video here. In the next video, as you might expect, we'll go into examples of applying this method to more complicated functions, that is functions with exponentials and logs, product rules, fractions, etc., etc. And we'll make sure the process works the same, but we'll make sure you have lots of examples of how this can play out. But I'll wrap up this video here for now, and I'll see you next time.